All right, thank you. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of Colossians. I appreciate that special, and what a glorious day that's going to be when we see the Lord uh, someday. And uh, we may go through some trials uh, and some difficulties, but it's going to be worth it all when we see the Lord. Colossians, chapter number 2. Colossians, chapter number 2, and um, this verse actually came... Uh, to mind as I was looking at the verse of the day that we put out. Uh, our church puts out on, on Facebook, and we, we have a verse of the day that goes out um, uh, you know, during the week. And I, I saw this verse, and I sort of looked at it, and it sort of outlines itself, these verses. And so the Lord impressed upon me um, to, uh, to preach a message out of Colossians chapter 2, and on these particular verses... Um, we're going to be looking and starting at verse number 4, Colossians chapter number 2, and we'll begin reading together verses 4. We're just going to read through verses 4 through 7. And uh, so let's all stand together as I read out of respect of God's word. If you're able, we'll stand together. The Bible says in Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 4, um, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. I want you to notice in verse number 5, as Paul, who wrote the book of Colossians, this letter to the church here, um, he, verse number five says, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order. The title of my message this morning is Beholding Your Order. Let's have a word of prayer as we get into the message today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time we have to be in your word. Lord, I pray that you would Guide my thoughts and my words as I bring this message this morning, Lord. May it be what you uh, would have us to hear. Um, and Lord, I pray that you would use me today and help me to, uh, to, to bring glory and honor to you. And as a church, Lord, may we uh, seek you today and, and try to find what you would have for us. May we be open-minded and open-hearted, Lord, towards your leading. And Holy Spirit, you're working. Thank you for all that you have done in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Paul desired that this uh, that the Colossians stay on the right track as he dealt with, and we talked even I think some about this last week as as Paul went around and he he started and established churches. He would check up with those churches and and see how they were doing and and want to. Um, be familiar with the ministry and how it's going. His desire was for them to stay on the right track and to keep going the right direction as Paul would travel on his missionary journeys and he would find out of churches that have started uh, and hear about them. He would sometimes contact them and write them letters and, and encourage them to keep moving forward and to keep doing right. And Paul's desire for this here, uh, these Colossians, is that they also um, would do well. Uh, and that they would stay on the right track and continue following uh, the direction of the Lord. Uh, verse number 23 of chapter number 1 says, If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every uh, creature which is under heaven, whereof I Paul and made a minister. And so his desire for them would to be grounded in their faith and settled, and we'll see uh, in the verses that we read today, even, that Paul's desire is that they are on the right track. They are grounded in the Lord and that they are growing in the Lord. We see in the book of Colossians um, a lot of great truths that Paul teaches to them. As we read through the book of Colossians, one can see that Paul taught them and gave them uh, some wonderful, wonderful truth. Notice, if you would, in chapter number 1, we see the truth that Christ is equal with God the Creator. Notice, if you would, in verse number 12 of chapter number 1. Colossians 1, 12 says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in, uh, in light. 
who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. So who is it that gives us redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins? The Lord Jesus Christ, his Son. That's what it says here in verse number 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So amongst the context of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God, verse number 15 says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, um, had created all things. And we see that in these verses. Wonderful, wonderful truth we see in the book of Colossians. Christ being equal with God, the Creator. We see uh, the idea of being yielded to a new man. Uh, to, the new, to the new man. We see that in Colossians chapter number 3. Turn over to Colossians 3. It's one page over. Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, uh, fornication, uncleanness, uh, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, with his, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Taking off the old man. Putting off the old man. Putting on the new man. Um, when you got saved. The Holy Spirit came in and dwelled inside of you. The day you got saved. The Holy Spirit now dwells inside of you. Um, he is part of you. You are now a new creature the Bible says. You're quickened or made alive. And we still struggle with that old flesh that we were born with. We have our old flesh and those old desires that our flesh wants to do. But we also have the Holy Spirit now dwelling inside of us. And we have the ability to have victory over the flesh. It's a matter of what we yield to. Are we going to yield to the flesh or are we going to yield to the Spirit? And Paul gives them this incredible truth of yielding to the new man. The new creature that you know, now are because... You've trusted Christ as your Savior. We see many other wonderful truths as well within this book of Colossians. Of course, within a lot of the writings of Paul. And as God, uh, the Holy Spirit, used Paul to write these uh, letters and, and, and what we can learn of him. And Paul's desire is that those in Coloss the, the Colossians would continue to grow and continue to learn. Even in Paul's absence, he wanted the Colossians to know he was with them in spirit. Notice in chapter number 2, verse number 5. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit. Paul says, I cannot be there physically, but yet I, I think of you. I pray for you. Um, I desire that you would grow. Uh, my desire is that you would learn more of the Lord. Um, uh, you, you know, I, it's very, it's very, uh, very dangerous to connect yourself with, with a man. Um, and it's something we warn about here often. Now we believe that the Bible has the office of a pastor. And of a, uh, the, the pastor is to uh, be an over, uh, a shepherd over the flock of the church. And there's a lot. I think everybody ought to have a pastor. Um, everybody ought to have a, a, a man of God in their life. That can pray for them. And help them in their time of need. And, and be used in their life. Um, but yet, if the pastor himself, I, I as a pastor here at the church, if, if I were taken out or not here for some reason, um, I would hope that you would stay grounded in the truth of God's word. And I'd hope that you would continue to grow in the Lord even in my absence. And Paul says, I may not be able to be there with you physically, but I'm, I, my spirit is there and I think of you and I remember you and I pray for you. And my desire is that you would continue to grow even in my absence. And we ought to be grounded enough 
that of those who have a great influence over our lives, and there are those who have great influence over our lives. Uh, I have a man in my life who's a great influence, my pastor, Mike Monty. Um, uh, he, he has introduced me to everything I know as far as learning the Bible and reading the Bible and, and this idea of, of getting to know the Lord and, and what the Bible says and just knew the Bible like you wouldn't believe. He could teach the Bible. Uh, uh, he understood it in and out and, and he uh, had a, a, such a, an understanding of God's word. And furthermore, he knew God's word uh, in depth, but he could also teach it and give it in a way that everybody understood and people actually enjoyed listening to the Bible. I remember when I was, uh, oh, I must have been 12 or 13 years old, and uh, 13 or 14, well, maybe 14 or 15, and we had been to a lot of churches in um, uh, uh, all over the state of Minnesota, a lot of different churches we had visited because we were uh, going to one church, and we'd be there for a while, and uh, then my parents would decide to go to a different church for one reason or another, and I, I was, wasn't involved in the you know, decision-making process a whole lot. I don't know why they decided to go to a different church. I didn't know what was going on. I just, I was a teenager just going wherever mom and dad went. And I remember going to these churches and my fault, you know, is there's nothing, uh, you know, whatever, but I would go to these churches and I, w- I, I would just be bored to tears as a teenager. I would just sleep through most of the services or daydream through most of the services, draw or color or do something, you know, that didn't, had nothing to do with the church service. I was bored with it. I'm hoping that maybe the teen group would be kind of cool because certainly this guy isn't any interesting. That was my attitude. Until, until we came to Calvary Baptist Church, Robbinsdale, Minnesota. There was just something different there. People sang like they loved the Lord. Uh, there, was a, there was an excitement in the air when you walked into the church and people loved it. And, and then preacher got up to preach uh, and it wasn't the typical bore you to tears kind of a And I'm not going to name any churches that I went to before that. (laughs) But it wasn't the typical bore you out to tears kind of uh, drudgery making it through the service that only the adults who have been seasoned Christians for a long time can actually enjoy. (laughs) It was exciting. I mean, he seemed to be excited about what he was preaching. And he seemed to want to take the truth of the Word of God and put it in a level where everybody could understand. And I, I had never been in a church like that where people were actually seemed excited. And I had to look around the room and half the people were falling asleep and half the people were paying attention to something else. And, and people actually wanted to be there in church. And I remember coming to that church for the first time and, 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 and seeing the excitement and the joy that was there and getting to know preacher and, and seeing the influence he had on my life as he began to help me to grow in the Lord. I began to learn the Bible and for for years, for years, he would write out a sermon on a uh, legal size paper, uh, you know, long yellow, those long, long yellow legal size paper notebooks, and he'd write a sermon out on that, and he'd put his points, you know, and he would circle things and whatever. And after he was done preaching, he would leave it on the pulpit. And I figured that out as a, as a young man, and I felt maybe God was calling me to preach, and I would, I would go up to the pulpit after the service, and I would take his sermon. Because he would leave it there. I figured if he's going to leave it, I'm going to take it. <laughs> uh, and, and I had hundreds of his sermons until he figured out I was doing that. Then he started keeping his sermons, and I couldn't get them anymore. Uh, and so then I started, I thought I got a Bible that had a wide margin uh, Bible, and I would write down all of his points um, as he was preaching, and, uh, and I would put the title of his sermon. And, uh, and so uh, the title of the sermon, and, I would, and on the back there was a, a bunch of blank pages which had lined on them, and I would write down the title of the sermon and what page it was on. Uh, and so I could find those sermons in the Bible. I had that Bible in my office. I have those sermons that he preached. I have them in a file in my office. And, and uh, I have thousands, thousands of sermons that he preached, and no doubt I learned how to preach by outlining the sermons as he preached, now, I can't preach near as good as he did, but I, I learned how to preach by outlining the sermons and, and writing those things down and paying attention to that stuff. And, and man, he had such influence on my life. He's the reason that I, 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 you know, I believe the Bible. He, why, do we do, why do we go through the Bible starting in Genesis 1.1 and we're just making our way through for the adult Sunday school class? That's exactly what he did at the church I grew up in. He started in, re, in Genesis 1.1 and just started going through the Bible verse by verse. He went from Genesis 1.1 all the way through Revelation you know, 21 all the way to the end. Took him about 20 years. <laughs> and then after that, 
He just started back over in Genesis 1-1 again because it took him long enough to get to the first time and there's a whole different group of people there. And so he just, you know, he started all over again. That's, that's the reason why I do that in our adult Sunday school class. That's what I've always known from him. And, and I was influenced by him in such a great way. And, and so many things I've learned from him. Uh, but then when he passed away just a year and a half ago or so, a very tragic situation, and he's now gone, um, uh, I, I'm thankful that I'm grounded enough that it didn't shake my world. Amen. Hey, you know, I'm going to continue moving on. In fact, he didn't die in a, in a graceful way. He didn't die in a way that you could go and pay honors to him and... and and in fact, they, because of the, he, the sin he was involved in and the way he took his life, his own life, and the, the funeral that they had, it was, they tried to take away any resemblance of him being a pastor, and, and they really did a very generic type of a funeral. It's actually very difficult to go to. And that could have crushed me, because he, him being the greatest influence I've ever had in my life, and that could have really done a lot of damage, but it didn't. Why? Because I'm not attached to a man. Thank God for him. Thank God for the influence he had on me. Thank God for the messages that I heard. You know, it was of the Lord. Just a couple weeks before he passed away, someone handed me a phone, just an inexpensive phone that they had gotten. They, they downloaded all of his sermons off of the website from the church and said, Pastor, I want you to have this. You know, I was going to get it for my wife, but she likes his twin brother, Mark Monty, and so I got the wrong guy, so you can have these. Uh, and, and so I have all of his sermons that they had on the website, hundreds of them, uh, different books of the Bible he went through. And of course, when he found out to be involved in great sin, they took everything of him off of the website. No way of getting a hold of any of that stuff. But it was the Lord that I was able to get that. Uh, and the Lord saw me through that. But the truth of the matter is, I was not so connected to him that my life was crushed when, when he fell. And the truth is, I'm grounded in the Lord... And I was able to move forward. And Paul's desire was even in my absence, you would continue to grow and to do well and to do right. Paul recognized an order to things. Notice if you would, verse number five. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So what did they have here? Um, what did the Colossians have? And, and uh, uh, maybe um, uh, verses 6 and 7 are actually in an order that would be good for us as a growing process. Uh, it could be uh, some of these things are necessarily in order of importance or in order of timely growing, but there certainly is an order to how they did things. Paul recognized that and found great joy in that. I want to give you several points this morning in beholding your order. As Paul looked at them and was encouraged by them, as he wanted to be an encouragement to them, was also encouraged by them. I want to give you several points this morning as we consider this order, beholding your order, beholding those Colossians and what they did. Number one, as we look at these this church in Colossae and these Colossians, um, and number one, we see they received Christ. Notice what it says here, verse number six, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. The most important decision anyone will ever make, putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for our sins. You and I, and I, I trust that most of us today here are believers. As far as I know, people I've talked to and, and, and we don't have a lot of uh, visitors here. We had a couple. They left. Ran them out. <laughs> we, uh, as far as I know, okay, everybody here is saved. You and I run into people every day that are lost. They don't know the Lord. You better thank God for the wonderful gift that you have of salvation. No matter what happens in this life, and we struggle with things. We struggle with sin. We struggle with all the... Is, our schedules are so busy. You know, we, we struggle with balancing everything, and sometimes it's difficult and hard. Uh, but at the end of the day, you can rest your head at night knowing that someday you're going to be with the Lord. Uh, if there's anybody here who's not saying today, you better get that settled. You have no idea, no idea how much time you have left. You have no idea when your last day is. Uh, just about a year ago, I think it was in Fountain City, and a gentleman got up and, and got ready for the day and drove his little pickup down the road and his car stalled on the way to work on, on some railroad tracks and it could not get the car out of there in time, was hit by a train and killed. He did not plan on that being his last day of his life. 
You have no idea when your last day is. Uh, today's the day to get that settled. If you trust that Christ as your Savior, you have a blessed hope. You're looking forward to His return. And as I said, no matter how difficult life may become, someday we're going to be with the Lord. And we thank God that He provided a way for us to have a home in heaven, that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. We can have a relationship with Him. We can, we can know the Lord. We can have a life full of His joy. and We can have His presence. And we can follow His leading. They receive Jesus. Christ is your Savior, um, as ye have therefore received Je uh, Christ Jesus the Lord. They knew the Lord. They received Him. Number two, not only did they receive Him and know Him, number two, they walk in Him. Notice what it says here in verse number six. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. And let me tell you something. You can have received Jesus Christ as your Savior and be born again Go into heaven, you're going to go to heaven, but you're not walking in him. That is a possibility. You could live the rest of your life not walking with the Lord, giving into the flesh, uh, serving the things of this world. I had this discussion with someone just the other day. It's difficult to imagine. Um, I don't know how we got on the topic, but we were talking about those who are off into sin. And it seems like really bad sin. And you list, you know, you look at the list of what brings on the wrath of God in the Bible. Romans, you know, chapter number one. And talked about the wrath of God in Revelation 14. Other places in scripture. And sometimes you see a list of these sins and what brings on the wrath of God. And you say to yourself, man, you know, those guys are wicked. The, the inventors of evil things and haters of God. And, and this list of fornication and, and all that kind of thing. But then you see in that list things like liars. Or disobedient to parents. And you think to yourself, wait a minute. <laughs> Some of those things are things that I do. And it's difficult to imagine. Okay, no one's going to get to heaven because they avoid being a fornicator. No one's going to get to heaven because they avoided, you know, being a homosexual. No one's going to get to heaven because they lived their life without ever lying. You only get to heaven because you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's hard to come to grips with the fact that there are those who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ but are not walking with the Lord and are making poor decisions and are doing things that are not right before the Lord and someday they're going to get to heaven and completely regret the decisions that they have made and have no reward to the judgment seat of Christ. But the truth of the matter is, but by the grace of God, you and I would be in that same place. We have an opportunity to walk with the Lord and talk with Him and fellowship with Him and we have received, they have received Christ, and they also walked with Him. Walked in Him. They allowed God to guide in their life. They allowed the Lord to direct in their life. They can look back at my own life and, and look at the times when, when I wasn't sure how things were going to work out, but I allowed God to give me direction. I fought, tried to, attempted to, at least the best I could, to follow the Lord's leading. And He brought me through. In the fall of the year, Linda, a young woman, was traveling alone up the rutted and rugged highway from Alberta to the Yukon. Linda didn't know you don't travel to White Horse alone in a rundown Honda Civic. So she got off where only four wheel so she set off where only four wheel drives normally venture. The first evening she found a room in the mountains near a summit and asked for a five AM wake up call so she can get an early start. She couldn't understand why the clerk looked surprised at that request, but as she woke up to early morning fog shrouding the mountaintops, she understood. Not wanting to look foolish, she got up and went to breakfast. Two truckers invited Linda to join them, and since the place was so small, she felt obligated. Where are you headed? One of the truckers asked. White horse. In that little Civic? No way. This pass is dangerous in weather like this. Well, I'm determined to try, said, Linda's guts, uh, said Linda Gutsy, if not very informed response. Then I guess you're just going to have to, I guess we're just going to have to give you a hug, the trucker suggested. Linda drew back. There's no way uh, I'm going to let you touch me. No, not like that, the trucker said, uh, chuckled. Well, we'll put one truck in front of you and one uh, on, the, on the rear. And, and that way, you'll get you, we'll get you through the mountains. All that foggy morning, Linda followed the two red dots in front of her and had the reassurance of a big escort behind as they made their way safely through the mountains. 
When we walk with the Lord, it is guiding us through the fog of life. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, you've all seen that, the footprints poem. And then you have those two set of footprints in the sand, and then you have all of a sudden one set of footprints, and then you have two set of footprints again, and someone says, this is like, I, I don't know the whole thing very well. I, I, it's something, something about the Lord was walking with them, but then there the difficult times the Lord was carrying them <laughs> through, you know. Uh, and that's why you see one set of footprints. Um, and things like that are kind of cute, but the truth of the matter is the Lord does walk with us, and God will bring us through those difficult times. We have to allow the Lord to guide in our lives. We have to walk with him. We have to spend time with him. Uh, uh, we receive Christ, but we also walk with him and walk with the Lord, okay? Number uh, three, get rooted and built in him. We get rooted and built in the Lord. Notice verse number seven. Um, rooted and built in him. We have to be rooted in the Lord, knowing the Lord as we walk with him. We, we receive Christ as our Savior and we get excited about the things of God. There's something about that, that first, that brand new Christian that first gets saved and they're excited about it and there's, a, there's a, an excitement and a joy that is there. And Then they begin to walk with the Lord and during those times it's easy to do because you're excited about everything and, and you can tell them anything. Uh, and they would say, man, let's do it. Uh, and it's exciting to have those kind of people around, really, because they, they bring an excitement into the church. But they walk with the Lord. Eventually, they're going to have to get, they're going to have to get rooted and built in Him. Eventually, they're going to have to become established in Him, all right? Get rooted and built in Him. Uh, uh, begin to know the Lord. Uh, begin to really understand who He is and, and begin to really understand what His Word says about Him. God tells us about Himself through His Word. Why are there so many churches today that are so off? <laughs> they, they get together every Sunday, but they are in complete uh, rejection of the things of the Bible. Because they're worshiping in the name of the Lord, but they're not getting to know the Lord. And they're not, uh, they're not building, they're not rooting themselves and building themselves in the Lord. And they have these services that have, uh, many times, are a complete violation of what God's word says. But yet, uh, uh, but yet they're never getting built in Him, and they're never really bringing honor to the Lord. Get rooted and built in Him. Are we doing what we can to help others, to build others, help build others up? Are we doing what we can to uh, be there to encourage others, to help build them up and to be uh, what they ought to be? As I watched them tear a building down, a gang of men in a busy town, with a ho-heave-ho ho, and a lusty yell, they swung a beam and the side wall fell. I asked the foreman, are these men skilled? And the man you'd hired if you wanted to build. He gave a laugh and said, no, indeed, just common labor is all I need. I can easily wreck in a day or two what builders have taken years to do. And I thought to myself as I went my way, which of these roles have I tried to play? Am I a builder who works with care, measure, lift by rule and square? Am I shaping my work to well-made plan, to a well-made plan, patiently doing the best I can? Or am I a wrecker who walks to town content with the labor of tearing down. O oh Lord, let my life and my labors be that which will build for eternity. Are we building? Are we building each other up? Are we coming closer to God with our daily walk with Him? Number three, they got rooted and built in Him. Number four, become established in your faith. What do we have here about these uh, Colossians, number four, uh, they were become builded, uh, I'm sorry, they become established in, in, in their faith. Verse number seven, Rooted and built it in him and established in the faith. Know what you believe and why you believe it. Why are so many young people growing up in a good home and going to good schools, abandoning all the convictions they once had? Close friends of mine that believe the same way I did, believe the Bible, just believe what the Bible said, are, are abandoning the truth that they once had. They never got established for themselves in the word of God. I, I preach a sermon, a message that I believe um, is one of the most important messages I could ever preach to young people. Um, I preached it recently at a, a chapel service down in Prairie du Chien, and I preached it in our chapel service, of course, and, and uh, at camp, and a lot of times I have an opportunity to speak to young people. And it's all about the Pharisees who were there when the, when the uh, man was healed of, who had the withered hand. And the Bible says about the Pharisees that they were filled with madness because 
Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And what happened there? They had set up a standard that was so important in their minds that when the Messiah himself performed a miracle, they didn't recognize it to give him glory, but rather were filled with madness because they crossed the standard they had put in their own lives. And so often, we have young people that they know the truth, but yet they, they get off on false doctrine, or they set up a standard in their life that is not in line with the Word of God, and they become just as the Pharisees, filled with madness and go every direction, rather than knowing the Bible, and rather than being established in their faith. They go wayward to what is right. Number five, what is it about these Colossians that Paul said, uh, joy in and beholding your order. Number five, they continue to learn. Look at what it says here in verse number seven. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught. They're continuing to learn. They're not saying to themselves, I have arrived or we have come to the place where we know what everything we need to know now and We've not come to the place where we are now the teacher and you are now the student. And, and we are the ones who have the answers and we have it all figured out. And Now, no one would ever actually be as bold as to say that. But so often people have that attitude of, um, I've come and I've come to the place where I have done all that I can and I've served all that I can and I, I know all that I need to know. And now I'm to the place where someone else can pick up the mantle and they can do their job. God is through with me. Or they feel as if um, they're to the place where they no longer have to serve because they have arrived and they're at a place where they no longer have to learn. And that's too bad. Because the truth of the matter is, according to the book of Ephesians, it will take ages to come to learn of all the riches of Christ. We will ever be learning about how great our God is. And none of us, none of us, will ever get to the place where we've arrived in our knowledge of the Lord. As a pastor, I have a wonderful opportunity to study God's word. I have a wonderful opportunity to be able to take time during the day and just sit down and read God's word and, and meditate on it and study it and, and look at what other people think about it and consider what they say and, and, and dissect it maybe or whatever. Or just, just study the word and, and really get into enjoying God's word. And what a wonderful opportunity that is. But seven years of being here and hours upon thousands and thousands of hours of doing that, I have barely scratched the surface of what God's word has to say. And I could spend my whole life, and we could take all of our lives combined and do that, and we would still barely scratch the surface of all that God has in his word for us. We need to continually be learning. Learning from God's word, learning from the Lord, learning from those influences that God puts into our lives. Uh, continue to learn as they did. And number six, we'll close with this. Always be thankful. They were always thankful. Notice the end of the verse number seven. Well, verse number seven says, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, um, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Always be thankful. There's something about an attitude of thankfulness. Something about abounding therein with thanksgiving. Um, something about the person that has the attitude of, I'm just thankful for what I have. That they don't have the attitude of, you know, um, discontentment. They don't have the attitude of, I want more. They don't have the attitude of, I'm not happy with what I have. Uh, they have a better attitude of, I'm just thankful for what the Lord has given to me. And it's something about those people who are thankful who are thankful for what God has done in their lives, who are thankful for what God's given to them, that have a good spirit about them. This last week was Thanksgiving. What a wonderful holiday. What a wonderful time of year to, to stop and be thankful. Um, you know, all these stores are trying to make more money, and so they're bringing that whole Black Friday thing. I don't know when Black Friday ever became such a big thing. When I was growing up, I never heard of the term Black Friday. Somehow it became a big thing. And now they're trying to push it even into Thanksgiving Day. And it's all just too bad, really. I ought to be thankful. God's blessed us with so much. Uh, I mean, I dare say almost everybody in this room Thursday had eaten more than they should have. And there was a lot more food sitting on the table when you were done. <laughs> and you put it in the fridge and you pull it out later and had a turkey sandwich with mayo. <laughs> That's just a good idea. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're so blessed. We have so much. 
so much to be thankful for. God has been so good to us. And that, that spirit that you have when you're thankful, when you, when you just say, God, you're so good to me and thank you for all that you've done. And I praise the Lord. So often we open our prayers with, with, with thank you, Lord. And what a great way to open a prayer because we just got to say, God, thank you for how good you are to us. Paul noticed an order here in verse number, verse number five. Joy in beholding your order. And he noticed that these people were thankful. Are we thankful to God who's done so much for us? We can be grounded. We can be rooted. We can be saved. Praise the Lord. We can walk with him. We can know him better. Uh, we, can, we can continue to learn of him. And we can just thank God for all these things he's done for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for how good you are, Lord. We thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that you would just continue to do a work work in our lives. Lord, help us to understand you and know you better. Help us to be established in you, Lord, and help us to be rooted in you. Uh, Lord, help us to build each other up and to help each other to grow. Uh, and Lord, help us to be thankful. We are so thankful, Lord, for how much you have blessed us. Help us to remain with that thanks, thanksgiving spirit that, that just recognizes how good you are to us. With our head bowed and our eyes closed in just a moment, the altar is going to be open. It will be an opportunity for you to make a decision for the Lord. If God's spoken to your heart, you can come to this old-fashioned altar. We still have an altar call here. You can come to this old-fashioned altar and kneel at the front pew or kneel at the altar and talk to the Lord. Maybe you just need to thank Him for how good He's been in your life. Maybe there's someone here under the sound of my voice and you've got sin in your life, something that's come between you and the Lord. And you don't feel as if you're growing closer to him anymore, as if you're, you're, you're being pulled away. Maybe you need to come to the altar, get that settled. Someone here that's not saved, you don't know for sure you go to heaven. If that's you, you come forward this morning. I'd love to show you from the Bible how you can know for sure. Whatever the case may be, if God's spoken to your heart, this altar is open for you. Let's all stand as we stand together. If God's spoken to your heart, you come forward. This altar is open for you.